What's going on? It's Pod Sun Radio, your favorite podcaster from Phoenix, Arizona. I always like to talk about my favorite food in Phoenix, Arizona. Being a native of Phoenix, Arizona, I'm a big, huge fan of Mexican food. My favorite Mexican food spot to eat at in the local area is Salsita's Mexican food, and it should be yours also. So if you live around the 43rd and McDowell area, make a trip right now. It's on the northwest corner. That's going to be 1501 North 43rd Avenue, Phoenix, Arizona, 85009. Go check out Salsitas. Tell them Pod Sun sent you. But Pod Sun Radio, we are back in the house right now. It's Sunday night. I think the Cardinals lost today, so, I mean, that's a bad thing. But it's definitely a beautiful day, and we're happy to be back once again. We got a very special guest in the building. We're doing a different type of episode than what we would typically do. You know, we've done our music. We've done our sports. We had the girls in. Today, we got our first official gaming episode going on. You know, so it's, I'm very happy to be here. We got my man Cameron Dayton in the house. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me on, man. Man, nah, the, the blessing is ours, man. The pleasure is... I want to say this might be our top guest for sure so far. <laughs> you know, I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings out there. But Cameron has done some amazing things, which we're going to talk to you about. But, you know, what we do on our show, the first thing we like to do is kind of uncover who you are. So we like to get to know Cameron. You know, getting to know Mr. Cameron Dayton. So um, where did the legend of Cameron Dayton begin, a.k.a. where were you born at? <laughs> so I was born originally in Salt Lake City, Utah. And so, uh, but right after that, I moved out to Los Angeles. My dad was doing med school out of UCLA. So uh, a lot of my formative years out in Santa Monica, mm -hmm. L.A. area. Um, moved around a little bit after that. Um, ended up going back to college in Utah and then back out to California. That's where the entertainment industry really, really is. And so I worked for some of the bigger game studios out there. Mm -hmm. a studio called Blizzard Entertainment. They do World of Warcraft and Diablo. Uh, uh, Overlock is, is one of their, or Overwatch is one of their big games. Um, and uh, that's where I kind of uh, uh, started working with some of the bigger titles yes. that I work on. So. Man, and it's funny because Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, and Santa Monica. That is polar opposites, <laughs> man. So you kind of got the best of both worlds. Where did you, where did you actually go to like school, get high school and college at? So yeah, that was actually all in Utah still. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, it, it's a very polar opposite sort of thing. In fact, it's funny. My my Facebook feed has like some of the most liberal and some of the most conservative uh, viewpoints. So I feel like I get a, a, a broad stretch of America pretty much <laughs> just by logging into Facebook because yeah, they, uh, the philosophies, the thoughts, the dynamic, the energy mm -hmm. is very different in those two places. Yeah. Now during your schooling, were you already like heavily into video games? Is it something you were passionate about from a young age? And what was, if so, what were some of your favorite video games coming up? <sighs> well, so I played games, but I always thought, that's an irresponsible career choice, right? And so, so, <laughs> so, so dad was a doctor, so I was going to be a doctor too. Mm -hmm. So I was headed to pre-med stuff. So I was doing my AP classes. I did my physics, my chem, my OCAM. I was, I, that is where I was going because that's a responsible career, right? That mm -hmm. is, that's, you, can, you can take care of a family if you're a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, it actually wasn't until my, it was my junior year in college that I had kind of a revelatory moment. Mm -hmm. Like, like you know, one of these times in your life where everything just lines up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, Toy Story just come out. I don't know if you remember oh, that movie, Of course, right? man. That's one no. of the greatest movies of all time. Uh, exactly, right? And, and it is a movie entirely generated on a computer. And so that, for me, that was, that was mind-blowing, that, that using something entirely made of metal and silicon, right, mm -hmm. they created a story that was heartwarming and human and real. And, uh, and so that happened. I, uh, I had just submitted my first short story for publication, nerdy science fiction short story, right? And everybody told me, you got to get used to rejection. Like mm -hmm. you're going to get, you're going to wallpaper your house and rejection letters before you get an acceptance on that. And I just hit the lottery or something like that because mm -hmm. my, my story, my first story got accepted mm -hmm. in a national magazine. So all of a sudden Ooh, I'm like, moment. <laughs> so all of a sudden I'm like, you know what? I can actually make this creative stuff work. Mm -hmm. So I've been following the uh, the work of Michael Crichton. He's the guy that wrote Jurassic Park. Oh, wow. uh, he's been doing a lot of blockbuster films. And, <clears throat> and, and his story was he was actually a surgeon mm -hmm. and then had his first story accepted and then it just blew up. And he's, you know, he's done, you know, some of the, some of the biggest uh, film franchise and bo best-selling books yeah, uh, yeah. In, in, in our history. Um, and so I was kind of thinking, I'll, I'll do that. I'll be a doctor, yeah. and then I'll do my writing on the side. And I realized that was, 
it's kind of a backward way of doing things, yeah. you know? And I think if Crichton could start over, he'd be like, forget about medical school. I'm just going to go right into right. Absolutely. And so the third thing that happened is the school I was at had this anonymous donation, several million dollars in 3D hardware and software. Anonymous. Blue, anonymous. Oh, it was laundering money. And so, <laughs> maybe it was laundering money. You can talk to BYU about that. But, uh, they, uh, but they didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so here, I just seen Toy Story. I was just encouraged to do something creative. So I actually, myself and a couple other students, we went and made a proposal to the, to the, uh, the administration. We said, let's create this 3D animation, 3D entertainment, mm -hmm. computer major. And they said, well, what are the classes you teach? And I basically looked through the catalog and said, well, these are all the classes I wish I could have been taking yeah. instead of anatomy and, <laughs> and yeah. chemistry and all that. Stuff. And uh, so, so they went for it, they bit, they turned it into a major. And so myself and my buddy Sign moment. Were, the, were the first to graduate from BYU's computer animation program. And it has since become a major feed into Pixar, into DreamWorks. They, they like they like hiring animators out of Utah because they get to work as soon as they're you know as soon as they're on there. So man, that's amazing on a program that you pretty much structured. Yeah, yeah, and and, <laughs> and was the was the first to get out of, and so so that kind of got my momentum going. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we we my buddy my buddy Donald and I that we just graduated from this uh, this program, we uh, and some other of our friends founded a, a game studio called Chair Entertainment, mm -hmm. and it was based around uh, uh, Plato's philosophy. Of, of the chair. The idea being that for every chair that exists in the world, there is one perfect chair. It may be ideally in our minds that they all have some little element of that. And so we, we, we wanted to make a game studio that would, that would do that, that would create these, these amazing games. And we were dumb and ambitious and just kids right out of college. And so our first game was uh, critical success. We tried to do way too many things. I don't think I even slept for the first two years while we put this game together. It was, it was, uh, three different games all woven, woven together. And so we learned a lot doing that. Um, kind of uh, circled the wagons, decided, okay, let's, let's trim down. Let's make a game that is, that is solid, that's, that, that's just focusing on what we do best. Mm -hmm. um, and really that turned into uh, Infinity Blade. Which was the best-selling game? Sign moment. That's huge. On the, yeah, what do you mean? Yeah, it was a best-selling game on the iPhone in 2007. That is what convinced Epic Games to actually come by our studio. Mm. And so all of a sudden, we we were a success, right? And so that's when I started talking to Blizzard Entertainment, mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted to bring somebody on that was a storyteller, that was a game uh, designer, and yeah, that's where I got to work on. World of Warcraft, which at the time had 12 million players concurrently. Wow. And that, there were more people in this virtual space than the population of some nations. Like, it, it is a big, big community, right? No, it's um, time moment. I don't know how many times <laughs> I'm going to keep doing that. Um, and I, I got to work on, uh, on, on uh, Diablo and Hearthstone and, of course, Overwatch, uh, which was, is the, the big game right now. And so mm -hmm. it was an incredible experience. It was a, amazing. Man, that's amazing. Truthfully, you just that was honestly mind-blowing from the <laughs> making the program to those are the first games that you really went big with. Those are some of the biggest games Right now. And then I got to give a shout out actually to my buddy Donald that graduated from the program with me. Mm -hmm. He is currently creative director over at Epic Games and is overseeing a little project called Fortnite. Don't know if you're going to Man, shout out to Donald. <laughs> shout, shout out to Donald, man. Shine moment again. Oh, my goodness. That's my Pretty daughter's cool. favorite game. Oh, yeah. It is, I, I think, everybody's favorite game yeah, under the age true. of 12 right now. It, <laughs> is, it is a monster. And so, so yeah, so currently I'm creative director uh, at Sledgehammer Games, and we've uh, just put out Call of Duty World War II. Which was the uh, bestseller in uh, 2017 on the PlayStation, and Time on the game. and it was. So it we was, don't call this episode. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, it's been it's been a, it's been a very interesting ride, a very unexpected ride. Mm -hmm. I, you know, according to my original plans, uh, I was supposed to be, you know, a radiologist right now. Who knows? Who knows how different that life would have been mm -hmm. than me pursuing uh, uh, my passions pursuing, you know, the, the, the creative side of things. No, nah, I think it's great to hear that. And when you were young, like taking it back to, you know, high school and uh, college days, would you say your creativity was a direct, dir directly deriving from just having a wild imagination? You know, like, is that what really got you into it? Or you just like video games? Yeah, you know what? I think there's a little bit of both, you know, like video games, I always thought were an interesting way of telling a story. Because if you if you read a book, it's pretty much structured from you know from beginning, middle to end, yes. and even a movie has that kind of structure. With a with a video game, your hero, your protagonist, 
is also your audience. And that's a very different sort of story because I don't know if my hero is going to go off to fight the dragon mm -hmm. or sit on the beach and watch the sunset mm -hmm. or go make some oatmeal. I mean, you, you're not in control of your audience or of your mm -hmm. hero. So that means they get to tell this story. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I love that challenge. I love that. I thought it was exciting trying to tell the next generation of stories. Yeah. You know? And was it like science fiction that you immediately delved right into as far as genre? Or are you kind of moving around? You know, I, th I think because I had a little bit of that, that pre-med training, there was a lot of science behind that. I naturally gravitate towards stories that have science fiction because mm -hmm. it's a language I speak. I can talk about the atoms and the molecules and the, yeah. and the anatomy and all that stuff. But, uh, but I've worked on, I've worked on a lot of fantasy games. I mean, World War II was a history game. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable just about in any of those spots, but my novel is a science fiction novel. And yeah, that, that just tends to be my, that's what I, that's what I want to talk about is uh, Ether Walker or is that how you pronounce it? Ether Walker, Ether Walker. Yeah, Ether. I know that was what I'm saying, but I'm, uh, Cool glasses, too, by the way. Y'all see that. he got the polos on. <laughs> but, uh, I actually just got these. My other ones are broke. So. Man, it was nice. Oh, they broke, so you went and picked these, uh, these old things? Uh, 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 <laughs> that's right. All right, so when you wrote the novel, like, how was – was it an immediate smash success? And what was it like for you? You know, what was your life? Like, how did it change? Yeah, the novel? well, I mean, that gets that gets really personal. I, I had been working on the novel for years um, and was getting close to being finished. And then uh, – Kind of had some some tragedy in my family. Uh, my mom ended up passing away from breast cancer. Sorry, um, to hear that. yeah, we went through a divorce. You know, those, these things that happen in in life, yeah. and they got held out. And so finally, I just said my goal was to uh, to have it done by you know by by a certain point in my life. And so I just said I'm going to sacrifice everything else and just focus on getting this done. Um, and I talked to a couple of the bigger publishers, you know, and they wanted me to just hand over the book. And they're like, we've got our marketing team. We got, and I was like, you know, I've been working on these games. I'm so much more into transmedia, the idea of of uh, storytelling through websites and through Twitter and everything else. And so I actually went with a smaller publisher, Future House mm -hmm. Publishing, because they let me take control over the design on the cover. They let mm -hmm. me take control over some of the marketing. Like I, I do a lot of uh, sketches as I'm, as I'm as I'm writing to help me visualize what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I would release those to to the gaming audience on Twitter, and they're much more of a visual crowd anyway. So I was able to bring in a lot of gamers mm -hmm. to that that were into the story I was telling, um, and uh, yeah, it was it, it was kind of a surprising hit out right yeah. out of the gate. It, it was an Amazon bestseller. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we, uh, there was a, a period where uh, Ready Player One, Ernest Cline's amazing science fiction book, the, 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 the movie with Steven Spielberg, um, was at with the top place in cyberpunk fiction. At the apex of my sales, I actually knocked it down to number two. So I was the, the number one bestseller in cyberpunk for uh, two weeks on, uh, on Amazon. So that was... That was really validating, right? Rockstar, I was like, rockstar. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. Right. I don't. I don't think. I think geek status is yeah, probably. Still, what we're yeah, man. <laughs> you got fans. You too. You still a rockstar. Right. <laughs> well, it's it's a whole new world. Like like being a geek now cool is thing. not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be you were the the kid that got picked on. You were the kid that was you know, uh, people didn't understand. And there, there's there's a, such a large population now of of geeks that are into fantasy and science fiction and games um, that it's not the weird sideline thing anymore. Yeah, nah. It's mainstream. I look like the average rapper. That's I, right. I know all that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but um, all right, let me ask you this. So we had to, we got to kind of meet each other and have a cool conversation right. the other day, and we're not going to get too much into personal life or nothing like that. But um, you seem very passionate about your children. So I wanted to know, and I'm, I'm, of course everybody is, but yeah. like you said, you know, you, you're doing things that you don't even have to do. But I, my question is, is that something that it was like when you first became a father or did it take some time and it kind of just changed and you was like, oh, man, I got to do this? Oh, yeah. No, it's uh, – well, you know this. The minute you have children, you, the world changes for you. Mm -hmm. The world changes for you. They are they are the inspiration for everything. They're the reason why I do everything. I'm, mm -hmm. I want my kids to be able to look at dad and say – Dad pursued what he loved. Mm -hmm. He went after it responsibly. I mean, it's not like I went, you know, just just crazy out and, yeah. and you know tried to try to change the world. You you gotta you gotta take steps, and that's something I talk about with my kids all, all the time. My my youngest daughter Morgan is uh, said she wants to write a book, 
And of course, she was all excited. She'd been reading the Harry Potter books. And, yeah. and so I said, okay, Morgan, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to do an outline. Mm -hmm. We're going to do the story beats. Who's in this? We're going to write all your characters. We're gonna, and her eyes went big. She, when she realized the immensity of this work, and I told her, I said, Morgan, if this is what you want to do, you'll put the work in. That's what it takes. It'll be worth it for you. Mm -hmm. And you'll know that that's your thing. And she has been very good at it. We have got three marker boards of the house filled up with story ideas. And um, it's something I, I, I think it's an important lesson for kids to learn is um, just being passionate about something isn't enough. You've got to no. put that work in. No, man, what they say, uh, faith without work is dead. That's it's right. absolutely That's dead. Right. You got to put the work in. All right, so then what what excites you about life overall? I mean, other than your kids, like what else gets you excited other than in, in video games, right. of course? Right, right. I, I love, um, I mean, we live in a very fascinating time right now. You know, everybody's connected. We've got these tiny little devices here that can immediately put us in touch with anybody on any side of the world. The entire written works of mankind are accessible through this. Mm -hmm. I can ask any question and a little robot which will respond and give me the answer. Yeah. Like knowledge is at our fingertips, is at everybody's fingertips. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm excited by what that means. Like there has never been a time in the history of humanity where um, so many people had access to so much information. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a good thing. I, I'm generally hopeful about people. Mm -hmm. I know we've got some dark things in the news and the media today. Um, but I think overall people are good at heart. And I think if you arm them with the right information um, and the right tools, um, uh, the, the world can be changed. So no, absolutely. And the media spins that like there's, I got friends who play basketball overseas, Middle East, and they're like, man, that's nothing like what they make it look like. That's yeah. just, you know, they cook it up right. on the news. So, of course, you don't. Because they're telling to stories and they want to they want to get they want to get, you know, people involved. But that, that's been my experience as well. You know, I've, I've been traveling a lot over the last couple of years and every single country I've been to, there are good people there. Mm -hmm. And they're good people who love their kids, who love their culture and who love, you know, meeting new people. And really this uh, idea of you know, being afraid of strangers, being afraid of uh, people from other walks of life. Yeah. Um, I think, I think as a culture, we're going to, we're going to grow up past that. Yeah. Another yeah. sign moment. That was a, a moral sign moment. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> all right. So now we talking, uh, we talked about Sledgehammer a little bit now, but just going a little bit more in depth. How did that begin exactly, you know, and then where were you prior? I think you said you were with Blizzard. Yeah. Okay. So, so I was a Blizzard for about six years. Um, and uh, had an opportunity to actually get out here in Arizona with the studio. And I've been flying back and forth to see the kids every couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I would love to actually get out, get a place, you know, be, be there a little. And, and the kids were just stepping into that kind of pre-adolescent age where it's just so important to be there. Yeah. Um, so, so I left. And a lot of people were like, why would you leave Blizzard? Why would you ever leave? Blizzard is like, you know, <laughs> the, the, the best of the best. I said, well, there are some things that are more important than making games. That's right. And uh, and so, and I actually got to surprise the kids. I actually um, was the weekend I was out there. Usually, I just get a hotel where we'd be yeah. out there. But I was like, guys, I want you to read this letter with me. And they were all I actually got a picture of us all like leaned over this letter. And my daughter's crying, and it's, it was amazing. So, so I got so I was able to kind of establish a, a homestead out here. So that's my place. It's, it's just uh, just a couple miles from here, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's made the homestead. So now. You know, I'll, I'll take a job. Like right now, Sledgehammer Games is out in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. But I make sure, I'm like, if I'm going to take this job, you need to know my family and my life is in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And so I will come here and I work, but I, I need uh, to be able to leave early. Fridays, I'm off. I'm out in Arizona. And, yeah. and uh, it's nice to be at the point in my career where I can say that and I don't have to haggle. I'm like, either get me and that's the deal yeah, or, or, or not, right? Or, or I'm out and, and they've been And they've been wonderful. They've been really good about it. And so, so you know, I'll get a, like a, a tiny little studio out in San Francisco, which, by the way, is like twice as expensive as a house out here. But, um, but, but it's all I just sleep out there and I wait. Wake up your there. studio in California is twice as expensive as your house out here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. My goodness, it's crazy. But that's funny. So he said he went in and told him, "There's no Tyler Degen nights without Ricky Bobby." <laughs> all right, but <laughs> let me ask you this. So I, I read something that I thought was super cool about Sledgehammer Games, huh. man. I read it said, and I don't know if it's true on the internet, but it said they have less than 1% turnover since when they opened. 
Is yeah. that true? And what would you attribute that to if it is? Yeah, it is true. It's it's just there's a great community there. It's they they do a great job of making sure everybody feels invested. Everybody feels like they are part of the team. Mm -hmm. um, they they talk regularly, like managers, employees talk about what are your goals, how are we helping you achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of great, you know, just kind of team building activities, like like the the launch party for for World War Two. They synced up with the Christmas party, and they they held it at the uh, like the, the Capitol building uh, out over in San Francisco oh, wow. downtown, and it was you know You're like too much money. No, it was oh, it was, but it was, but this was a team that for three years had been putting blood, sweat, and tears into this. It was a thing where they, any other company could have said, "Hey, that's their job; they got to yeah. do that." But this was this was very much a uh, a celebration for the team that had worked so hard to yeah. put this together. Yeah, and no, that's dope. I want to come to the next one. All, all right, right. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, um, how do you engage with like the people who are working on the floor when you walk through, and how do they engage with you? So I prefer like I like to work with the teams face to face, um, and so I like kind of more of an open kind of seating deal. And so I've got a team of designers, a team of artists, animators, um, and uh, you know we all just kind of like throw out ideas. I like this idea of kind of a uh, create a mosh pit sort of thing where mm -hmm. everybody can throw that in. Um, but because so much of what we do is visual, I've got a marker board that's just on wheels and I literally, I cart this thing around with me because sometimes something would take me like a hundred words to say, I can do a quick sketch and immediately yeah. get that idea across. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and so it's funny because it becomes kind of the, uh, and after hours, the place where we draw cartoons, characters yeah, of each yeah. other, make jokes, and um, but it's a, but it's a great team, an amazing team that's been able to put this together. And I'm lucky to work with some, probably the most uh, uh, talented crew, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the industry. Yeah, no, I watched the guy take a tour through there, and I was like, man, that's a dope office. It was, like, really and I like the open floor plan mm -hmm. versus you guys hiding off in your offices. Yep. Or yeah. stuff like that. That always, I feel like, makes for a more cohesive well, team. It's the power. I mean, creativity. When you've got a, a great idea and you you combine it with somebody else's idea, it's uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. You know, like like there's something about two ideas firing off each other that goes in an entirely new direction. And that's something that you know I compare that when when I work on my novel. That's just me, mm -hmm. and I get to kind of explore where I want to go. But but I'm limited to that as well. When you've got you know. A collection of brains, clever, talented, brilliant brains. Uh, you, you get all sorts of like creative surprises. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of fun. No, nah, wholeheartedly, I like that, man. That's why you guys is, is winning. You gonna keep winning. <laughs> all right, now um, only a few more questions. But what was the feeling like first getting to work on a Call of Duty title? Like, and were you already a big fan of the of oh, the yeah. actual game? Like, oh yeah. When you guys first start producing them, I was a big fan, and I'd even back when I was at Blizzard. I, I on the evenings I like to teach at the local college, and I taught mm -hmm. a, I taught a class on uh, in-game narrative, mm -hmm. and uh, I would use Call of Duty as an example for creative, innovative ways of telling a story. There was in one of the Call of Duties, Modern Warfare Two. Uh, there's a scene where a nuclear bomb goes off, and you're in a helicopter with your other soldiers, and the chopper spirals down. And as a player, you crawl out of this burning chopper. I remember that. Scene. You're 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 irradiated, mm -hmm. and you you crawl like 20 feet, and you die. And the next level, you pick up as your best friend, yeah, yep. and you and and can you name a movie where? Where you feel like you need to get revenge on yourself, like like it was that that is that is a type of storytelling that just goes in a brand new direction. So mm -hmm. so I had this this almost a reverence for Call of Duty for that franchise, and so I knew if I was going to be working on it, it had to be some of my best work because there is a, a, an enormous fan base. They're very passionate, very passionate, even to the point of like yeah. they will express their love and their hate, their hate yeah. without without holding back on that. And so I knew it had to be it had to be some of my best stuff. Yeah, and what I was from what I was seeing, it was like, man, you guys had lost a lot of your staff right before you guys started working on the first title, and then had like only twenty weeks to get it done or something yeah, like yeah. that. And and that that happens in games a lot. There's just um, a lot of times we'll, we'll compare it to like once the game is out and we're doing updates and and mm -hmm. patches, it's like trying to to work on a running car while it's on the street, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's moving, yeah. and you still got to keep it going while you're changing it. Um, and, and yeah, and, and because of the way the industry is, we have employees hopping to other studios or we're bringing new ones on. Mm -hmm. So it's all about uh, creative problem solving, yeah. both for the game and for the team, you know? You got you. Okay. All right. So that was um, about it on that. But um, Or actually, no, one more question on Call sure. of Duty. 
what all titles has uh, Sledgehammer Games produced specifically? Because I was reading online, but it was like back and forth. So I'm like, I don't know. Because my, we got something. We went and bought a game. Uh -huh. I was memorabilia. But sure, sure. Which titles exactly? So no, I've only been with Sledgehammer during World War II, during Call of Duty World War II. That was and the biggest one. Yeah, yeah, that was the the most recent there. And so I'm a relatively newcomer newcomer mm. to this, but the team is made up of people who worked on. A lot of amazing titles like the two founders uh, Glenn Schofield and Mike Condry uh, had worked on Dead Space mm -hmm. which is considered one of the best uh, horror first-person shooters of all time mm -hmm. um, after that when they they founded Sledgehammer uh, I know they spent a lot of time working on um, uh, several of the Call of Duty titles mm -hmm. you know and that's why uh, Activision which actually owns the entire franchise has three studios that make Call of Duty since it takes two years to make a game mm -hmm. Treyarch will make one Infinity Ward and Sledgehammer. Mm. So we're part of like the trifecta that makes those games. And each of the studios has become kind of renowned for being uh, an expert in a certain type of game. Like mm. Sledgehammer is now known for we make the historic like like classic warfare sort of games. Mm -hmm. You know, Treyarch does the Black Ops games. Yeah, like that's their that's their bag. Um, and in Infinity Ward, they can get kind of exploratory. The last one was was very science fiction. Uh, you know, battle in space sort of a thing. Yeah. And so um, so it's fun because it means we get to deliver a different flavor to the audience yeah. every year. Okay. So. All right. And being a zombie, man, uh -huh. and obviously nowadays zombie is the cool thing and everybody yeah, embraces Zombies are hot right now. And stuff <laughs> like that. What's it like with all the like different shows and movies that are coming out? Does anybody like try to lean on you for expertise or anything like that? You want to know, know something funny? I... Through no fault of my own, I don't try to do this, but but I've actually worked on three of the bigger zombie games in games. When I was in uh, at Blizzard, uh, I did some writing and dialogue for World of Warcraft: Wrath of the Lich King, mm -hmm. which is the expansion where the undead were coming out of the frozen north, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. At Scopely, I was director over the Walking Dead: Road to, Road to Survival game, mm -hmm. which is the biggest mobile game about zombies. And then then on Nazi zombies, I got to do this one. So. I'm going to get a little geeky on you right here. Thank you, Each sir. of those zombies had a different way they came about. Like in World of Warcraft, it was magic. It was dark mm -hmm. magic, you know, necromancy. Um, in The Walking Dead, it's more like it's a disease, like a biological sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I was told to charge up this idea for the Nazi zombies, I wanted to do something different than that. So if it's not magic and if it's not like a plague, a disease, something like that, mm -hmm. what was happening in Germany in the 1940s? You know, and I got it. And that's when a lot of... Um, Physics was being discovered. Mm -hmm. Niels Bohr had come up with the idea of, the, of how the atom worked, and we had, mm -hmm. you know, and this is where we got Einstein, right? And this mm -hmm. is where we got the ideas for the atom bomb. So I decided I was going to come up with an idea that was more related to to physics, to uh, a new type of energy, a, a combination of the electron and the graviton that could be moved through the human nervous system, and blah blah blah. Anyway, yeah. But it was so much fun. Like once I locked into that, I called up a buddy of mine at, uh, at Cal State. I said, I want to make sure my science is, is on point, you know, yeah. and uh, accurate. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's funny because 99% of the fans will not care about that. Nah. But the 1% who does, they will be loud about it and they will let it know and they will, you know, they'll make it stink if you don't have it. So I always want to make sure my science is as, as, as good as it can be, you know. No, nah, that's dope. Okay. All right. So I think that's it with the game. But um, did I go too geeky? I'm nah, going to go too nah, geeky there. Honestly, I'm going to listen back. Like, I. I I hate when I if I can't grasp some grasp something, then trust me, I'm gonna go figure out exactly. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. About. I'll show you notes about the gravitons. It's uh, I've got all sorts of pages and pages on the the stuff that nobody will care about in the game, but but I do. You know, yeah. and I think I think it's that attention to detail mm -hmm. is is what it means to be a professional. No, one hundred percent, and you paying a lot of attention. All right, so now tell me this. Um, where do you kind of see the gaming industry going, and what direction is it is it headed? I think it's getting big, and it's going to be bigger. You know, uh, uh, last year, uh, gaming industry made something like twelve billion dollars more than film, um, and I, I we're seeing games kind of expanding into every part of life. Like gamification is the term we're seeing, um, and we're seeing apps. You know, now that everybody has the ability to play a game on the on this little console right here on their phone, uh, we see it. Every, my, my brother, my brother went to law school. Right, he was a lawyer for a year, hated it, but he noticed he's like, you know, all these lawyers, um, and none of them are using LinkedIn, Facebook, social media to expand their contact list. What if I made an app? What if I made a game that made that fun, that gave them a little reward, a little achievement for doing that? And uh, and so he just took a risk and made an app for it. 
it has now been picked up by some of the biggest law firms around the world. He flies all over the world to sell this game for lawyers. Wow. That's where we're going. We're going to see every single job out there is going to have a way you can play that as a game. And that, I'm going to get super optimistic and idealistic yeah. about this now. I believe when everybody has a job that they love to do, a, a game that they love to play, then we're not going to have people getting home and grumpy and, and pissed off. We're going to see a uh, uh, lessening in anger and lessening yeah. in dissatisfaction nah. and more uh, more kind of unity throughout people. I think it's going to be a very good thing. I think we're headed in some good places. I wholeheartedly agree. I'm coming yeah. with you. Do it. I've got, I got a, the hardest question I asked you all. Day. All right. PlayStation or Xbox? Oh, uh, okay. I have to give, see, I'm not on either side of the fence because each of them have amazing games. Each of them have incredible, you know, uh, opportunities. And I own, I own both. Mm -hmm. um, but, but just like, disclaimer. Just, that's my disclaimer. And I love, like, I just played the latest God of War on the PlayStation 4. Amazing. Um, of course, you know, Xbox always has its own, you know, category of incredible games. So that's, that's all the disclaimers. But, <laughs> dancing. but the very first game I made, uh, we made it on the Xbox. So I've got there's a there's a nostalgia thing there's a there's a little love there and I just I love the interface I use it even you know, my Xbox one is my entertainment system sort of yeah. thing so, yeah. so Shout out to Bill if you Gates wanted an answer there Microsoft. you go <laughs> you know what's crazy man you huh. actually kind of look like Steve Jobs <laughs> <laughs> anybody ever tell you that I, I get that sometimes yeah yeah even maybe the way you carry yourself uh, kind of Steve Jobs. I go home and shave immediately when I hear that that's yeah. right. <laughs> no it's funny I actually the reason I grow this out. Because my hair is kind of preternaturally gray. Yeah. If I don't shave this, I look like I'm like in my 20s, and then nobody gives me any respect on the team, and then nobody listens to what I had to say. So I have to do this as a director, so yeah. that people will, you know, yeah, no, will just, follow my lead. Because yeah, you can't be nice and with no, uh, no, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'll walk all over you. Definitely. All right, so I just had to ask that. Okay, so what about any other future goals or aspirations or anything that you want to get into in the future? I know movies is a big thing. For yeah, me. yeah. Well, I had a lot of fun writing. I wrote the. Uh, I co-wrote the script for a movie called Unicorn City with some of the guys from Napoleon Dynamite. Mm. And it did the indie film run and was uh, selected by Netflix. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. I'd like to do that again. I just, uh, I've, I've signed a contract to finish out a trilogy around the Ether Walker book. So I got two more novels coming out. They're going to kind of round out that story. Um, I just, I just want to keep writing. You know, I, I love, I love creating and uh, I love uh, being able to, to tell stories and, Got lots of avenues to do that out here. Yeah, we need some Arizona science fiction stuff, man. I'm up for that. We gotta there, move you around there, the city a little more. There we go. There we go. All right. And um, other than that, I mean, if you want to just give like shout outs or talk about any people who helped you along the way on your journey, anything of that nature, man. Sure. You know what? Um, and, and actually, the, oh, this ties in uh, to to my time out here. After I was leaving Blizzard, um, I got on Twitter and kind of let some of the community know that. And one of uh, one of the, the people I'd been kind of back and forth with on Twitter uh, is a, a, a fantasy author who lives out here named Sam Sykes. He was a, a big fan of the uh, World of Warcraft, and he welcomed me out here, introduced me to a bunch of his friends, kind of brought me into his circle. And there are a surprising number of very talented writers and creators um, out out in this area. And so my uh, my prediction is that the Phoenix. Scottsdale Mesa area is going to be the next hotspot for digital entertainment for technology there's just so much happening out here yeah. so so you, you are in the right place right now all right man well let's have some more fun next time I see you you're probably gonna be at the bar again <laughs> I'm not sure Make that happen. <laughs> but um definitely big and actually young Andre where are you at over there? You can't, you can't even see my man. But uh, we got the young kids in the house, so we're going to go ahead and get out of here, pop some radio, see what suggestions the kids got, because you know they push the future forward. But um, we want to give another shout-out to Cameron Dayton, give another shout-out to Saucitas, Marmara Creative. We out of here, man. Pop some radio. That's good. Good job.